Welcome back to the Dealmakers Podcast Show with serial entrepreneur Alejandro Cremades, best-selling author of The Art of Startup Fundraising and co-founder at Panthera Advisors. In this podcast, we ask our guests about their successful acquisitions and financing rounds. Hey guys, so just a quick overview here on Panthera Advisors as I think it might be of value to you. So Panthera Advisors exist in order to help founders that are in the process of raising capital or get their company acquired. I actually started the company out of incredible frustration because during my entrepreneurial journey, which involved building, financing, scaling, and exiting companies, I could not find a resource that was founder friendly and I could not get the type of support that I was seeking. So as a result, I made a ton of mistakes along the way. So if you're looking to raise capital or you are looking to get your company acquired or just need some sound financial planning and you're looking to get the best possible outcome in the shortest period of time, feel free to learn more by visiting us at PantheraAdvisors.com or just reach out directly and shoot me a note at Alejandro at PantheraAdvisors.com. All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So today we have a really incredible entrepreneur. I think that we're going to be learning a lot from his journey, a lot from adversities, uh, especially with some of the ones that he had to face as a, as a professional cyclist. But I think I don't want to make you guys wait any longer. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Robin Thurston. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. So originally born in Denver, Colorado. So how was life growing up there? You know, it was good. I mean, I, I, I would say that I've spent so much time away. I always find myself wanting to get back. So now that I'm back in Boulder, I'm uh, very, very happy to be here. But I was fortunate to grow up here, I think. You were kind of like uh, growing up there on a bicycle. You know, that's how you were raised. So tell us about the, the, the upbringings, being on a bicycle. You know, I was fortunate. I, I started, we, we had this program when we were in school where they would take you up skiing. And so I got into skiing very, very young. And, uh, you know, we had a, we had a fairly warm winter, one winter, and a friend of mine convinced me to get a bicycle. And we had a, we had an event here in Colorado that was called the Red Zinger Mini Classic. And uh, so I, I was, you know, nine years old when I first competed in that. And was fortunate that I did well. And so some people took notice and said, maybe instead of ski racing, I should be a bike racer. So I, I, uh, I got into cycling very early and, um, you know, just, I feel like it's crafted and sort of shaped my entire path in my life. You know, so many people that I know and so many of the experiences of a ha I've had have been on the bicycle. So you become eventually, um, a professional cyclist, you go to Europe and, uh, during one of those times, you know, there is a, there's literally one event that where you were like jumping out of a cliff. So what, what is that? What happened? <laughs> well, there, I have many crash events, but there was one event in France where I was following uh, where there was five, six guys off the front. And I was, I was maybe third or fourth guy back. And I was just following them down this hair pit, hairpin sort of cliff. And, you know, you, you, you give so much trust in the person in front of you in cycling that like you're literally you're following their wheel. And one of the riders just went straight off the cliff, like as if they just didn't hit their brakes at all. And there was no guardrail or anything. So we just shot. We, I followed him right off the side of the cliff, fell probably 20, 30 feet. I got very fortunate. I fell into a big grassy sort of patch. He did not get so lucky. I'm actually not sure what happened to him. I know he broke his hip and had a pretty bad concussion at the time. Um, but I was sort of fortunate. I, I crawled back up on top and I finished the race and then I passed out at the finish because I had a I had I had a really sharp rock hit my elbow and put I had about 45 stitches in my elbow, but I had lost a lot of blood over the last 30 or 40 k of the race. Um, so I passed out on stage when I was when I was up on stage and. Uh, so, you know, funny events like that. I had another one where I went through the back windshield of a team car, which which I would say was sort of the ending of my career. And, you know, I say, look, I was a good cyclist. I, I wouldn't say I was certainly one of the greats. And, I, you know, I think that was a realization for me at the time. I'd been racing 15 years and frankly was tired and, and had had, you know, some of these things happen to me. So I was, you know, again, I say sort of serendipity drew me back to the U.S. and went back to school for finance and was able to sort of create a new path, a new career. 
um, which unfortunately many cyclists have a hard time making that transition. So it was, uh, again, I just, you know, right time, right place and got a job for this, uh, another, uh, my first startup, which was a company called Lipper that got acquired by Reuters. So it was, it was all sort of serendipitous timing. And and one quick thing here, you know, before um, shifting gears to the next chapters in your in your career, is that in cycling, the team effort and the strategy is a really big deal. So how do you how how have you gone about applying some of those learnings to to building and scaling teams? You know, most people don't realize about cycling how big of a team sport it is. But you know, I think for me. You know, if you think about like the roles that there are on the teams, like, you know, you know, yes, there is, you know, when you think about something like the Tour de France or you think about something like the Giro, there's a definitive leader. Um, but the truth is that you get opportunities as an individual rider on the team. Sometimes if you're in, you know, the, the some of the strongest riders where there might be a specific stage or a specific, you know, um, you know, individual day of racing where the team gives you the ability. And I think, you know, that's. That's something that I certainly have learned in building my teams is that sometimes, you know, it really isn't about how much spotlight is shown on you. It's a lot about, you know, giving people and opportunities on your team to shine in certain situations. The other thing I just say is like the camaraderie. I mean, you know, when you spend years and years in, in, you know, vans and buses with your teammates, um, you know, you really learn that celebrating and, and, you know, that time and connectivity that you have together is a lot about, you know, what what builds the team into these, you know, and allows you to sort of operate in these very stressful situations. And, you know, for me, I think I think we try to do that. I, I, I often say we don't celebrate enough the wins. Like, I think that's true of so many entrepreneurs. But, you know, I, I try to and I try to really, you know, sort of, you know, raise up and reward people. Um, in our teams when they do well, because I, I think those are rare opportunities to kind of, again, build that camaraderie on your team. And in your case, I mean, obviously, yeah, like you were saying, you were lucky to to shift gears. You got your your degree. You went to, um, to, to, to actually work for different companies. And eventually, you know, here you are in Europe. You find yourself, you know, like having, you know, uh, uh, some drinks or maybe like some lunch with some friends. And then, you know, a very uh, interesting conversation sparked what became your baby, your idea to your first baby as a company. You know? so, so tell us about that, that discussion and how things came about, you know, those sequence of events towards bringing your first company to life. Yeah, you know, again, it, it, it sort of goes back to these moments of being on the bike and, and being with people that, you know, really understood that journey. And I was I was in a small town in Switzerland called Andermatt on this cycling trip with some Americans and some Europeans. And, you know, literally just one night at dinner, somebody said, oh, you know, it'd be cool if I knew the roads that, you know, here in Switzerland without you being here. And that that kicked off the idea for Map My Fitness, Map My Ride, Map My Run map my hike, all of those sites that, you know, I, I knew there were like travel books, like I knew there were places that you could get these routes, and you could look for certain things, but they weren't personalized. It wasn't like, you and I know each other, and I make a route for you specifically, because I know kind of what psych, what type of cyclist you are, and maybe where you want to go, or you tell me you're going to Switzerland, and I could send you something. And I happened to be working on a project where I was working with a very early version of Google Maps API. And so I thought to myself, I wonder if I could use that to build this, this mapping tool. So, you know, we kicked off the project. Um, you know, I met my co-founder, Kevin Callahan, who was living in San Diego. He was an engineer from John Hopkins. And, uh, you know, we just got together, brainstormed and really came up with like how we were going to put this whole thing together. And uh, I thought it was going to be a small lifestyle business. Like I didn't actually think at the time, like it was going to become something that big until really the app store launched. And we were fortunate enough to build two of the first hundred iPhone apps with Map My Run and Map My Ride. And by November 2008, obviously, when the markets were melting down, uh, we had AT&T featuring us in those full page ads because they were the exclusive iPhone partner in the US and we had them featuring us as one of the apps on on all of the advertising nationally and I don't want to say the rest was history but man it was just a sharp up and to the right curve i mean it just we the downloads exploded 
you know, we were seeing usage across the board. Obviously, the use case and the product market fit was really, really good. So, you know, I left my my finance job. We 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 didn't take funding in 2009. We kept building the company because we had about three million dollars in revenue. And uh, you know, and then um, Austin Ventures down in Austin approached me. We we took a Series A from them. Um, we moved the business, the the largest portion of it, to Austin. But you know, and and then you know, out in 2013, out of the blue, Kevin Plank called me from Under Armour and was like, "What are you doing with the company?" And I said, "Well, I'm trying to build a big digital sports brand." And you know, we had about 20 million users then, and we were doing about 20 million in revenue, and um, mostly advertising, some subscription, a little bit of B2B sort of SaaS platform development for healthcare companies. And uh, Kevin was like, well, you know, come see me. And so I, I met with Kevin and 90 days later, Under Armour acquired us. So it was a really, really quick deal and, you know, really great outcome for the shareholders and for the employees. And, um, you know, and then I stuck around at Under Armour for three years. And why do you think it was the right time to sell at that point? You know, it's always easy in retrospect, as you know, to look back and say, oh, we should have held on to that for another five years. I yeah. mean, look what we could have done, you know, but I think there were two things for me is that the the competition in market was was obviously there was a lot of it in terms of the number of running apps and cycling apps and things of that nature. And I really felt like Under Armour gave us a chance to build something bigger. We really wanted to add on commerce as a big piece of what we were doing. And while they were a single brand with a single, you know, e-commerce site, we just felt like they were a really good marriage. And then the other thing I would just say is like I I really thought about the user data and I felt like Under Armour was very authentic in terms of how they were thinking about it, which was it was real they were just going to use the data to sell people better, you know, more product. And I thought the users would understand that whereas like if we had sold the data to like let's say we'd sold the company to a, a, like a, a healthcare company I don't know that they would have understood it as well what we were doing with it, you know. Yeah. So, what was the um, the amount that was reported by the press uh, of the acquisition? This is for 150 million to Under Armour. Got it. Well, I'm sure that at that point you were able to be in a position to buy any bike that you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's Which for I'm sure. sure it was life changing. So, so good stuff. So, so here at this point you become the the chief digital officer of Under Armour. Uh, and I'm sure that that was quite a shift because here you go from really building your company, going in full motion, speed ahead, and now you're part of a big organization, which obviously, you know, moves at a different, you know, type of speed. So, so how was that, you know, adjustment, you know, for you? You know, as you said, I mean, Kevin Plank and Under Armour changed my life and, you know, I feel tremendous loyalty to Kevin and the team, it was, um, I, and I love sports. I mean, I'm not just a cyclist, like I'm a huge football fan, soccer, Formula One, you know, basketball, you know, so for me going to Under Armour was like, kind of like being a little kid in a candy store. Like it was just like everything I possibly, you know, I mean, my first month there, I was at the Super Bowl, the, you know, like a, a boxing match in Vegas, you know, I was, you know, went to the um, national championship in college football, you know, so like it was it was just a really unbelievable time to be there. And the brand was kind of on, I mean, certainly was on fire when I when I first got there. I mean, the stock was at a peak, um, you know, and so that whole time and the camaraderie that the team had, you know, I felt like was really incredible. And, and frankly, I think was a unique situation for me. You know, sometimes as a as sort of a newcomer inside of an organization like that, it can be really hard, but I just felt like everybody from you know, Kip Folks to Kevin to, you know, Henry Stafford, they all just sort of welcomed me into the group. Um and so that was it was certainly a big deal and as well as they needed a digital strategy. I mean, that's what we put together. You know, we bought we bought a total of eight other companies put them all together under Connected Fitness and really unified that to grow the e-commerce business. And it was a venue for us to be able to do that and, and frankly, really worked out. I mean, I think the Connected Fitness um, sort of strategy was the right one. Um, they've made some you know, significant changes since then, but at least by the time I had left in um, June of 2016, um, I felt like it was really the right strategy for the company. And in this case, obviously, you you decide to leave. You um, ended up running another consumer uh, company, 
But here is actually in the in the in this moment during this journey is where you find your segue to really you know launch your next thing. You know, which uh, ended up being about you know uh, starting you know there with acquiring companies in COVID. I mean, you did like ten acquisitions in COVID. So so why don't you tell us about this uh, latest baby that uh, that you are working on and and what was that you know process of uh, of really coming up with the concept and and executing on it. You know, what I would call Outside 2.0, we obviously acquired Outside Magazine and Outside Television and rebranded the company when we acquired them to Outside. But, you know, when we started, um, it was sort of a, there was, my view is what has been missing from the healthy sort of lifestyle category or the, the active lifestyle category is what I would call the true definitive home of this person. Like, where do they go every day to not just to find inspiration? and training and things like that but where do they go to actually take action like to register for the next event or where they're going to travel to next or what gear they're going to buy and there just really wasn't like one place where all of those things came together and so you know when we started i would say it was a little bit more modest than that you know we started in the endurance category we were able to acquire the first brands triathlete magazine Velo news women's running and podium runner back from competitor group that sold to Ironman. Um, they owned the rock and roll series marathons, you know, so that was step one. We owned some cycling events in Colorado and we started building this personalization platform that really would unify that experience. Um, but we knew from the data that I, you know, from my, the previous data at Under Armour that 60% of the audience did at least three activities a year. And over the course of a lifetime, like, this year you might run and 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 ski and do a little bit of yoga. And next year you might switch and say, I'm going to ride my bike more. I'm going to start doing some hiking and, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to, you know, some other activity. And so you might totally change the picture of what you're doing. And there isn't anyone that's really evolving with you. That's saying like, okay, this is great what you're doing now. Here's everything you need to do that. But then how do we guide you towards the next thing that you're going to do? And people change activities for all kinds of reasons. Like you might have a friend who says, hey, I don't really like to run. Do you want to ride a bike with me? And you're like, sure, I'm going to give that a shot. Or you might have a group of friends. It's like, we're going on a big hiking adventure. You go do that. And after that, you're really into hiking, you know? Um, so there's a whole number of reasons why people switch from category to category. But we really wanted to build a place that wasn't just for one activity, but it really was about sort of thinking about how you could participate and sort of activate in all of those categories. And also, as we think about lifetime value, because we are very focused on membership, our new membership is called Outside Plus. And we're focused on that membership because we want to evolve with you and not have a lifetime value of our membership of a year or two years. But we literally want to be with you for your lifetime, right, as you sort of ebb and flow through that journey. So how much capital have you guys raised to date for, for outside? A uh, little bit over $180 million. Got it. So in terms of uh, now, you know, as you're thinking about like what's what's going to be really the the future and the and, 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 and what's in store for, for outside, if you were, you know, let's say to go to sleep tonight and you wake up in a world where the vision of outside is fully realized, what does that world look like? Well, I think that so many consumers just have like the thing I would say about the active lifestyle category is you will go through a lot of friction because you are so engaged. I mean, you know, I, I take a category like healthcare and you build these incredible applications for people and they don't really use them that much, you know, and I think that's really a bummer. Whereas like in the active lifestyle category, you know, people will put up with so much friction to register for an event or to buy a piece of gear or to, you know, find the content that they're looking for in the training side. My future vision is that all of this stuff is just much easier for the consumer and that it's really helping guide their next decision. So there, like when I think about how, think about how good a job Netflix does in putting the right content in front of you through, you know, AI as you go and basically watch one program after the next and they sort of understand, well, hey, here's what they might want to watch next. And amazingly, when you pull it up, you're like, yeah, that's super interesting. How do they do that? Well, that doesn't really exist in the world of active lifestyle. Like no one is put like it's all my view is it's all user sort of driven and it's there is a lot of friction. And so the future state world to me is 
it's not just about you self-discovering gear and content and events. It's like, how do we drive and put the stuff in front of you in real time that matters and will drive you to go do that activity? Because we fundamentally believe the world is a better place if people are more active and outdoors doing the things that they love to do. And so we want to make sure that flywheel is going in a future state is where that's all happening very automatically and you are inspired to do more and more activity because it's so seamless for you as a user. So then I guess uh, as you're now like really executing on outside, what is, you know, something that you experienced with Map My Fitness, you know, when you were building the business, that was perhaps a lesson that you absolutely knew that you were going to apply to to outside? Well, I mean, first I would say the investment you know, we we being outside, in my view, we are a product and technology company first. Um, and then secondarily, we're trying to build the absolute best and most authentic content and services that sort of plug into that platform, right? And I think my experience at MapMy is that, you know, in some ways, I feel like we lost at times maybe because we didn't build the, the best product in market. I think we had a great product, but I don't think we necessarily had the best product. And, and it was because maybe we didn't invest in much in, you know, engineering, design, product management as we should have. And so I think here, one lesson is like, we are over investing in that area to build this, you know, very holistic, personalized product for the consumer, because we absolutely believe it will resonate with them over time. The, you know, the other thing I would just say is like, how you take care of your team and think about diversity are things that, you know, I think we did okay at MapMy, but that we could have done a lot better. And so I would say I'm hyper focused on, you know, building the greatest team and the most diverse team so that we ultimately can get the benefit of, of what that means from an organizational perspective. So to expand on this, you know, imagine I put you into a time machine. And I bring you back in time. I bring you back in time to that moment where, you know, you just literally were, you know, stepping up, you know, from that conversation at that restaurant, you know, in Switzerland. And there you were, you know, thinking about maybe like launching a business. And imagine you're able to just grab that younger, you know, Robin and say, hey, hold on a minute. And you're able, you know, with all the knowledge and everything that you know today, you're able to give yourself one piece of business advice for launching you know, my, my fitness, what would, what would that have been and why based on what you know now? I would have grabbed that person and said, over invest in your team, whether that's the type of people and, you know, that you really invested your time in hiring, um, the diversity of the team that we would have hired and how well you treat them from, you know, everything from compensation to equity to, you know, other benefits. I, I really would have said do more because I think I think the outcome might have been different. I'm not saying it was a bad outcome. It was a great outcome and, you know, certainly very happy for where Matt might end up. But I think it would have been a different outcome. Got it. And in terms of, um, of books, what would, what would you say is a book that you wish you would have read earlier? It's funny, I'm, I'm reading a book right now, I'm going to forget his last name, but I'm reading a book called Product-Led SEO by Eli, I cannot remember off the top of my head, but frankly, I read half of it this weekend and in a weekend, and it's just an extraordinary book. I would have read that earlier because, you know, we had, one of the things I would say we did not invest enough in was essentially what I call sort of product, you know, development on the SEO side for Matt My Fitness. It took us a long time. Once we got it right, we started getting an enormous amount of traffic from that very early, uh, you know, sort of like midway through building the company. And I wish it would have been earlier. Um, I'm trying to think of another book that I just, I, I absolutely believe every entrepreneur should, you know, read. Like, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of big on this idea that you you really have to motivate your team. If you don't work on motivating your team, you just simply aren't going to get there. So I know there's a lot of books that sort of try to inspire you around motivating your team, but I think it has to come from you. It has to be like really organic. Like you have to believe that in what you are building, 
in order for your team to respond to that. And then you have to make sure you're telling them. You know, so any books in my mind that help the entrepreneur do that are going to ultimately help you craft a better story and message for your team. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that uh, without motivation, having that alignment and having the team with a sense of ownership is uh, is quite tough to achieve, you know, really, really great things. So, so Robin, for the, for the people that are listening, what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi? Um, you can get me, I mean, LinkedIn is a great place. I would say I always respond to people in my LinkedIn profile. Um, certainly, you know, try to respond on, on Twitter as a secondary. I use Facebook and Instagram more for my personal stuff. So not a great way. Like I don't do a lot of direct messaging in those channels. Um, but those are probably the two easiest ways to get a hold of me is Twitter and LinkedIn. Amazing. Well, Robin, thank you so much for being on the Deal Maker Show today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you like the show, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. If you could leave a review as well, that would be fantastic. And if you got any value, either from this episode or from the show itself, share it with a friend. Perhaps they also appreciate it. So also remember that if you need any help, whether it is with your fundraising efforts or with selling your business, you can reach me at alejandro at pantheraadvisors.com. You've reached the end of another episode of the Dealmakers Podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to alejandrocremades.com. Thank you for listening and see you at the next episode.